This is a mini lecture on big data and psychology. It's been estimated that up to 2003, the world generated about five exabytes of data. But now, in our increasingly digitalized world, we generate more than that every single day. So we are living in a big data world, but what is big data and how is it relevant to psychology? Big data relevant to psychology are often thought of as digital traces of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So while people are going about their day-to-day -day lives, there are thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that we are interested in studying as psychologists. So normally to study these phenomena, we would bring people into the lab to conduct an experiment, or we might run a survey in order to measure these phenomena. But with the increasingly digitalized world that we live in, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are commonly now leaving digital traces that we can access and analyze. For example, someone thinking about something or planning to do something might search for that on Google. Someone feeling something might express it on Twitter. Someone going somewhere might have that location recorded on their mobile device. Someone paying attention to something in the world or concerned about something in the world may interact with a news article. They might post something on Reddit or they might do something that leaves a digital trace through the streaming physiological measurements that are undertaken by devices such as Fitbit. So what does the word big mean in big data? We usually think about the three V's when defining big data. First is volume. These data often come with a very large sample size available. And in just a minute, I'll talk a little bit more about the actual benefits of that. Second V is variety, which means that these data often come with a very large number of variables that we can measure and analyze. And thirdly, velocity, which describes the characteristic of big data of commonly being frequently measured. So anything that we can measure at one point in time, such as something happening on social media, we usually can measure at many points in time moving forward. So we have a very high resolution temporal view of processes that we can study with big data. So let's focus on each of these individually. What are the benefits of big volume, or in other words, big sample sizes that we have with big data? Well, firstly, with a big sample size or a big N, we can study rare events. So imagine that only two out of about 100 people exhibit some phenomenon that you want to study. In this case, you would need many multiples of 100 in order to just get an adequate sample size of the cases that you're interested in. Another benefit of big N is that we can study small effects. So here on the x-axis, I show the sample size needed to have sufficient power to study effects of different sizes, which I show on the y-axis. So the important takeaway here is that as the size of an effect we want to study becomes smaller, and there are many small meaningful effects that we might want to study, the sample size needed becomes exponentially larger. To study important small effects, we often need very large sample sizes. Another defining aspect of big data is a large variety or a large number of variables that are often available to us with big data in contrast to classically collected data. So consider the number of variables that we might have when collecting data with a survey instrument. We may have demographics and some other measurements of interest. We may have 30 variables or so. Now consider the number of variables that we can quantify through data sources such as social media messages and social media activity. So we can quantify things like the number of friends, the number of friends of a certain type, how much they're talking about some topics such as health or baseball or politics. We can quantify things like the amount of time that they spend awake based on when we see them posting on social media and literally thousands more uh, possible variables that we could quantify 
that are of interest. And the same applies to the variety of data sources that we think of when we think about big data, such as data that are measured through activities recorded by someone's cell phone or internet searches, and so on. The third V of big data is velocity. This refers to the tendency of big data sources to be collected at frequent intervals over time. So with classic data collection procedures, we usually have measurements from just one point in time from each participant. Sometimes we do conduct studies where we collect repeated measurements, and it's most common in this case to have two or maybe just a few more points in time that we collect measurements from each participant. But with digital traces of human thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that are generated naturally, it's very common for anything that you can measure once to be available for measurement many more times. So with big velocity of data, we can make observations much more frequently than with classic data collection procedures. Now, what difference does this make? Well, consider observing a process at a single point in time. We might look at two variables and see that there is a tendency for them to be correlated. But when we can observe these two variables at multiple points in time, we might see that there is a much more nuanced relationship that unfolds between them over time. We often think of empirical data as falling into one of two categories, one being field observations and the other being laboratory experiments. Where do big data relevant to psychology fall within these categories? Usually they fall in the category of observations in the field because these digital traces of human thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are generated in natural environments and therefore big data often share limitations and benefits of observations in the field. Some benefits being that the observations are in a natural setting and some limitations being that we do not often as researchers have the ability to implement experimental designs. So what is the right way to think about big data in the context of classic data or traditional data? Some people crazy about big data would suggest that big data are a newer, better version of the data that we have traditionally worked with in psychological research. But this is simply not true. A better way to think about how big data relate to and compare with classic data is simply that both types of data have their own strengths and weaknesses and are useful for approaching research questions in different ways. So when they are combined together, you can capitalize on the strengths of both types of data and achieve the best of both worlds in tackling a research question. So big data and classic data can work hand in hand with each other. They can complement each other nicely on any given research topic by triangulating a research question with the types of data that are available to both categories. So for example, one way that they can work together is using big data to do a large exploratory analysis, taking advantage of the fact that there are often many variables available to us that we can analyze finding something of interest, and then bringing it into a more traditional data collection setting where we can study it with more control. Another way big data and traditional data can work hand in hand is by taking a result that was found in a traditional psychological study and then looking with big data to see if we can find evidence of it manifesting in a naturalistic setting that we can get measurements from using some big data resource. Now that we've seen some benefits and opportunities with big data, let's take a look at some challenges. Firstly, because of their observational nature, we can rarely do controlled experiments. This limits the causal inferences that we can make analyzing these data. We also have novel statistical challenges with big data. 
because they are generated without a statistical analysis in mind, they are often messy in the sense that they will require a lot of processing and often complicated statistical frameworks in order to analyze appropriately. With big data, incorrect statistical procedures can have very big consequences. For example, if you're analyzing a data set with thousands of variables and you fail to account for multiple testing, you will surely find effects that are simply there due to chance. Another challenge with big data is that substantial programming and database skills are needed to acquire and work with the data. A lot of processing is needed to meaningfully analyze big data. I previously explained that the big data often considered to be relevant to psychological research are digital traces of people's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. What are the tools that we use to extract and analyze these data? What's the apparatus that we use to work with them? Ultimately, it comes down to code. So to work with big data, a novice or greater ability in programming with languages such as R or Python is necessary. So I hope this has been a useful overview for you about what big data are and how they are relevant for psychological research. If you want to read some more about this topic, I'll leave you with a few papers, including some theoretical work on how to integrate big data in psychological research and some examples of empirical papers that have done just that.